337. Thank you, may be seated.
would, let's all stand together and turn over to hymn number 206. Hymn number 206. Two sixty-three. After the first verse, we'll go around and greet each other, welcome each other to the house of the Lord this morning.
Kings kids have a special for us this morning. You guys come on that. That's great. Good stuff. Amen. How many of you got all the words? 
You ready, ready for the evening service? Going to have the congregational special. Amen. Oh, that's great. Thank you guys so much. If you would, let's take your Bibles this morning and turn to 1 Kings chapter number 13. 1 Kings chapter number 13. I appreciate all the work that goes in with King's kids and learning good songs. They've, they went through all of that, went through salvation. Of course, 1 John 5 and verse number 13 talked about what it was, went through all the. It's pretty, pretty amazing whenever you can dissect a song, compare that with Scripture, make sure that it lines up, amen. And I, boy, I tell you, there's a, a, a lot of false doctrine that would be cured today if uh, we stopped singing it. Amen. <clears throat> so I tell you, that's wonderful. Appreciate that so much. First Kings chapter number 13, whenever you find your place, I'll invite you to stand with me one more time this morning as we honor the reading of God's Word. We're going to go down about halfway through this chapter. It's one chapter, discusses all of the same event. It's talking about a, uh, a man of God who comes and, and uh, he's going to make a pronouncement against the king, against uh, some idolatry that's taking place. We'll look into all of that. And, and then as he's leaving town, he's going to have a, a older prophet that's going to uh, seek him out and, and find him. And I was reading through this and it just, uh, it's an amazing account. But verse number 11 is where we're going to pick up. Verse number 11 says, Now there dwells an old prophet in Bethel, and his sons came and told him all the works that the man of God had done that day in Bethel. And the words which he spake, which were spoken unto the king, uh, them they uh, told also to their father. And their father said to them, What way went he? For his sons had seen what way the man of God went, and which, uh, which came from Judah. He said unto his sons, Saddle me an ass. So they saddled him the ass and rode thereon. And went after the man of God and found him sitting under an oak. And he said unto him, Art thou the man of God that camest from Judah? And he said, I am. Then uh, he said unto him, uh, Come home with me and eat bread. And he said, I may not return with thee, nor go in with thee. Neither will I eat bread, nor drink water with thee in this place. For it was said to me by the word of the Lord, that thou shalt eat no bread, nor drink water there, nor turn again to go thy way that thou camest. He said unto him, I am a prophet also as thou art. And an angel spake unto me by the word of the Lord, saying, Bring him back uh, with thee into thine house, that he may eat bread and drink water. And it says, But he lied unto him. So he went back with him, and did eat bread in his house, and drank water. And it came to pass, as they sat at the table, that the word of the Lord came unto the prophet that brought him back. And he cried unto the man of God that came from Judah, saying, Thus saith the Lord, For as much as thou hast disobeyed the mouth of the Lord, and hast not kept the commandment which the Lord thy God commands thee, but camest, thou, uh, camest back, and hast eaten bread, and drunk water in the house, of the which the Lord did say to thee, Eat no bread, and drink no water, thy carcass shall not come unto the sepulchre of thy fathers. And it came to pass, after he had eaten bread, after he had drunk, that he saddled for him the ass to wit, and the prophet whom he had brought back. When he was gone, a lion met him by the way and slew him. And his carcass was cast in the way, and the ass stood by it. The lion also stood by the carcass. I want to bring a message this morning of things that will cost you. Things that will cost you. Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you for giving us the opportunity to be here this morning. We thank you, Lord, for a scripture that you've preserved for us to be able to uh, glean wonderful truths from. I pray, God, that you would help us in our understanding. Help us, Lord, to put you first in all things. Lord, we just want to thank you for the love that you have for us and the blessings that you've extended to us in this day. We pray, Father, that you would have your perfect will and way. If there's one here that doesn't know Christ as Savior, I pray that today would be the day of salvation. We just want to thank you for it all and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Please do be seated. There's something so special about knowing and following uh, the will of God for your life. I've shared many times with you, and I won't belabor it, but I think about whenever... Uh, uh, whenever the Lord called me to preach, that was one of the, the scariest times personally uh, that I've ever uh, had because I couldn't speak in front of people. I would get so nervous. I, I couldn't, man, I would, uh, 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 you know, and, and you could feel your head getting red and feel like, you know, you'd rather die and, uh, and things of that nature. And, and, and I thought, I was like, how can God possibly use someone who cannot speak? Amen. Uh, that would kind of be important. And, uh, but I remember, uh, I remember thinking about sermons and, 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 you know, from the aspect of uh, things that I'd never really considered before. It was different whenever I was in the pew. As I was in the, in the pew, then I was always critiquing, uh, you know, uh, the pastor would preach and I, and I would, in my head, I'd be saying, oh, you know, a good verse he could have used would be this one. You know, why did it go here? I think, I think it would have been better, you know, and, and I, I'm sitting here and I'm adding up my own. Whenever it came time, whenever it's like, oh, I've got to prepare a sermon. 
complete blankness, no clue about what to do about anything whatsoever, you know? And, and I just sit there and I think, how could this happen? And then I started to reflect on, uh, as a kid, I remember uh, the, the pastor that I had, he, uh, he didn't preach long at all. It was 18 minutes start to finish from the, the beginning prayer to the final, uh, final just as I am, man, that was it. And, uh, but it was one of those, he was kind of geared toward preaching to the radio and, and I uh, think that he had a radio program and all that. So they were, you know, kind of shorter and also his sermons just kind of followed that same kind of pattern. I thought, well, maybe I could do that, you know, because maybe, uh, maybe 15 minutes wouldn't be quite so bad. But in reality, just the thought of being able to even orchestrate that per se, I was like, that's an eternity. It's like, man, I don't want to talk more than, you know, 12 seconds tops, you know, and, and it's, it's one of those things you start to, to wonder about. And, you know, God's really not interested in the timing, by the way. Amen. That's one of those things that as people we, we get interested in, but, but not so much with God. And I have uh, seen preachers that will hold uh, congregations captive for hours, you know, and, and, uh, but you know, it's one of those things you have to look at. And whenever they, uh, whenever the uh, desire of the people uh, is, is done, well, you know, then you're just kind of preaching to hear yourself talk, right? And so you, you want to make sure that you're honoring God and that God will take care of, uh, of the timing. Uh, one of the hardest things about preaching and, and this is, we was able to celebrate 14 years uh, here at, at Heritage this, this past uh, month. And, and, and I think about that and just kind of looking back on one of the hardest things uh, about preaching uh, is being tender toward the Holy Spirit. And uh, that doesn't matter whether you're the preacher or whether you're on the, in the congregation or whatever the case, but just being tender to the Holy Spirit. Uh, we can all be guilty of just kind of going through the motions and, and uh, taking control of things ourselves. Uh, but uh, if that's all it is, it won't be long. We're going to be out of touch with God. Uh, we're not going to be fulfilling the will of God. We won't have an interest in the things of God. And certainly it doesn't mean that your salvation is lost. You cannot lose your salvation. Uh, but our fellowship with God can certainly suffer. Uh, but God is always faithful, and He allows us to be able to have seasons of rejoicing and, and uh, times where we're trusting in Him, we're looking to Him, we're seeing His hand at work, and, and, uh, and it's a wonderful time. I've been so blessed uh, just to, to and, and, you know, again, start thinking about what God had done over the years, and I'm not going to belabor it, uh, but, but just to be able to think of the, the number of souls we've been able to be, uh, to, to see saved and trust Christ as Savior. Not, uh, you know, all of a sudden they're going to heaven. Hey man, that's just wonderful. And, and to be able to see God provide in ways that, that man could have never done. And the things that I was anxious about and, and had, uh, you know, the, this fearful thoughts about God just took care of all of those things. And God is so great to be able to meet the needs. And I, I think back on homes and families that have been established and secured for the cause of Christ. And, and, uh, those that were scattered for a while, then all of a sudden they, they get settled in the things uh, for the Lord. And, and it's just amazing to see what it is that God has done. I think about that whenever I was reading this chapter. I find it pretty interesting, this, uh, this account, it occupies the whole chapter. Amen? It's the whole chapter. A lot of details in here. And, and it's pretty straightforward, and yet I do believe that there's a message for all of us to be able to glean something from in this day. For the background, we're going to jump uh, right into a prophet of God. He's, he's being sent to deliver a message, and that's what we see here in the first few verses. Uh, what is happening here is the kingdom of Israel has been uh, divided. Uh, Israel was the northern kingdom. Judah was the southern kingdom. Uh, it started with Rehoboam. Rehoboam was the son of Solomon, and, and uh, he, uh, he had some good wise advice about how to rule. He forsook that wisdom, and, uh, and he took some unwise advice, and before long he was driving the whole nation into kind of a civil war, and he was uh, dividing, uh, dividing the kingdom. So sure enough, uh, Israel uh, was the northern kingdom uh, of that division, and Judah was the southern. Uh, Rehoboam re uh, remained king of the southern kingdom, although there was only two of the 12 tribes that remained with him. The other 10 tribes went with Jeroboam. Uh, Jeroboam went to the northern uh, portion there of, of Israel. So Jeroboam, uh, he led the nation into idolatry. And what it was is he had this fear that he was going to lose what it was that he had. Uh, so it got time whenever all of the Jews were supposed to be going back down to uh, the temple and being able to, uh, to uh, worship the Lord. And, and he said, man, we don't want that to happen. You know, they're going to they're gonna make that journey down there, figure out that it wasn't so bad. They're going to stay. He said, I'm going to lose all my people. So he ended up, he made a couple of golden calves and he put on the northern boundary of Israel and the southern boundary of Israel. And he says, behold your gods. You want to worship? Uh, this is where it 
is that you can worship. And that's what was going on. So he established one in Bethel and one in uh, Dan for worship. Now that became this whole pattern of idolatry uh, in, in himself and in his kingdom. And uh, it really just took hold of Jeroboam. I want you to back up just a little bit here to chapter 12 and see it. In chapter 12, verse number 31, it says that he made, a, uh, he made a house of high places and made priest of the lowest of the people which were not of the sons of Levi. Now if you remember the history of the, the people, the, the priests were supposed to be uh, Levites. They were supposed to be the sons of Levi. And uh, so he said he took the lowest of the people and he made them priests. Can you imagine? It's like, well, you probably can't imagine. We'll just leave it right there. Verse number 32 says, And Jeroboam ordained a feast in the eighth month, on the 15th day of the month, like unto the feast that is in Judah, and he offered upon the altar. So did he in Bethel, sacrificing unto the calves that he had made. And he placed in Bethel the priest of the high places which he had made. So he offered upon the altar which he had made in Bethel the 15th day of the eighth month, even in the month that he had devised of his own heart and ordained a feast unto the children of Israel, and he offered upon the altar and burnt incense. So here's Jeroboam. He says, well, uh, I want you to be able to worship, so we're going to set up a false god. We're going to set up some golden calves. We'll set them in the northern boundary, the southern boundary. And he says, I tell you what, I've got a good day for you to meet. This is going to be the national holiday. Uh, it wasn't God's leading. God didn't lead in any of that. It was all his doing. It was his leading, and it began to prevail. So God, uh, he sends his man. Man. He entrusts his prophet from Judah with the task of going to uh, Jeroboam and speaking against Jeroboam concerning this sin of idolatry that has come up. And that's where we get into chapter number 13. Now look at it in verse number 1. And behold, there came a man of God out of Judah by the word of the Lord unto Bethel. And Jeroboam stood by the altar to burn incense. So he's there at his false uh, altar. He's getting ready to burn incense to his false god. Now the man of God is coming up into that area. Verse number two, he says, he cried against the altar in the word of the Lord and said, O altar, altar, thus saith the Lord, behold, a child shall be born unto the house of David, Josiah by name, and upon thee shall he offer the priests of the high places that burn incense upon thee, and men's bones shall be burnt upon thee. What's he saying? Uh, he comes in, he's got a message of judgment. He said, those that are instrumental in offering all these false idolatrous offerings will one day be alter, er, offered uh, themselves. So the man of God, think about this, he comes out of Judah, uh, which is where Jeroboam was trying to keep his people from going down into. And so he comes out of Judah and uh, he goes to Bethel. He goes right to that golden calf idol. And as he's getting ready to be able to proclaim this judgment upon the idol and the things that are going to happen in the future, guess what? Jeroboam is right there. Amen. Uh, it's not like the king is doing other things a little farther away. He is right there in the midst of it. And the man of God began to share how God uh, was going to raise up a new king, and that new king would be named Josiah. And when's that going to happen? It actually happens 300 years later. Yeah. Amen. Man, God is true to his word. Amen. Amen. Jeroboam didn't appreciate it at all. Can you imagine? Here he is. He's, he's calling all the people, oh, this is your gods. These are the ones that del delivered you. This is the one that we're going to worship and everything. And then all of a sudden this man of God comes up and he says, by the way, that's an idol. God is going to tear down this idol. Well, Jeroboam did not appreciate that at all. Now look down to verse number four. And it came to pass when, the king, when king Jeroboam heard the sayings of the man of God, which had cried against the altar in Bethel, he put forth his hand from the altar saying, lay hold on him. And his hand, which he put forth against him, dried up, so that he could not pull it in again to him. The altar also was rent, and the ashes poured out from the altar, according to the sign which the man of God had given by the word of the Lord. And the king answered and said unto the man of God, Entreat now the face of the Lord thy God, and pray for me, that my hand may be restored me again. And the man of God besought the Lord, and the king's hand was restored him again and became as it was before. Isn't that something? So he, he's, uh, he hears the man of God preach, and he said, no, we're not going to do that. And he said, get him. And right then his hand just wow. dries up. And all of a sudden his attitude just completely changed. Hey Amen. All of a sudden, uh, what God was saying was, was true. That judgment had already begun. The altar uh, split, the ashes fall out, and he looks and he says, uh-oh. Yep. 
That wasn't in the script, but, but I'm pretty sure that was, that was it. And, and he said, would you, would you ask God to restore my hand? And that man of God prayed, and his hand was restored back the way that it was. Now, after the healing, guess what he did? He says, you should come to my house. You should come to my house. Now, why was that? Every king needs somebody that could heal you. Amen? Man, what a great, uh, great person to have on staff. It's like, ah, you know, I got a little tickle in my throat. Healed. Got a little leprosy. Healed. You know, and so that's what he's thinking. So notice the response here in verse number seven. The king said unto the man of God, come home with me and refresh thyself and I will give thee a reward. Isn't that amazing? I'll, I will reward you for this judgment of God. And the man of God said unto the king, if thou wilt give me half thine house, I will not go in with thee. Neither will I eat bread nor drink water in this place. For so was it charged me by the word of the Lord, saying, Eat no bread, nor drink water, nor turn again by the same way that thou camest. Verse 10 says, So he went another way, and he returned not by the way that he came to Bethel. Uh, the prophet tells Jeroboam, here's what he says, I'm not for sale. I'm not for sale. Uh, I've, I've got to be about God's business. He says, I've, uh, I've said what it is that I've need, needed to say. I fulfilled that part of the responsibility that God has given me. And now I'm leaving. What a pattern for a man of God. Amen. That's wonderful. We, we should belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. We should be devoted to his cause. And whenever we start thinking about this is what it is that God says to do, that's what it is that we should do. We should be following him at all times. We, we want to be a blessing to everybody. Amen. Uh, but, uh, but God is the one that's in charge. The orders that you and I have in our life, it's of God. It's not of man. Whenever God says, uh, Jim, I want you to preach. And I said, not so, Lord. You know, that was my argument. Man, you got to be kidding me. He says, no, no, I've got a purpose for your life. Is it going to be easy? Probably not. Probably not. Are you going to enjoy it? I did not. I'm just going to be honest with you. I did not. In case you kind of knew, uh, I was reading my Bible one morning there, or one afternoon there on the couch, and I was reading about Moses, and Moses was going through, and he was giving his five excuses. And I'd get to the end of those excuses, and then I'd turn around, and I'd read it again. And then I'd read it again, because it was, man, that was my exact same excuses. Exact same thing. So Kim was there in the kitchen, she said, what are you reading? And I was like, I don't read about Moses. At the time, the pastor didn't have anybody. The guy that was teaching Sunday school had, had uh, left, and he was having to do the Sunday school, and he was preaching and all that kind of thing. He was really needing somebody to help take a load off. And I said, uh, and she said, well, what are you thinking? I said, well, I'm, I'm thinking maybe I could tell the preacher that maybe I could teach a Sunday school. You know, because I figured, you know, if you give, give a little bit of something, maybe that'll just kind of ease up, you know. That, that's something, you know. There you go, Lord. There's a, there's a token, you know, like he really needs that. But then she asked me that question. Is that all? Amen. <laughs> no. I was crying. No, it's not all. It's not all. I feel like the Lord's calling me to preach. She was all excited. Amen. I was not. I wasn't excited. I was scared to death. Honestly, I was. And, and I told her, I, I still remember the conversation as if it was yesterday. But I said, don't tell anybody anything. Uh, I was not kidding. She knew I wasn't kidding. I said, I'll let somebody know when I want them to know, but this is not in my plans. This was not my desire. This is not what I went to school for. It's not what I'd been trained. This was so far outside of anything that I could ever imagine. It, it scared me to death. I didn't want to have... It was one of those things I just, I, I just can't imagine what God was thinking. But we have to come back to the point of God's the one that's in control. God gives us the orders. The Lord Jesus Christ is the head of this church. It's not the pastor. There's a, there's a position of authority and a pastorship and all that kind of thing, but Christ is the head of the church. It's His church. We have to be about his business. The passage addresses this matter of being devoted to God's purpose. Are we going to be devoted to God's purpose? Many Christians miss out on, on what it means of being separated unto God. We know that's, that it's important, and yet there's times whenever we just fall short of God's desire for our lives. It's that continuing that proves to be so difficult in our life. 
It's the continuing that, that seems to, man, we can get started pretty well, but the continuing, uh, it's so hard because all of a sudden the distractions in life begin to hit. We can be drawn away of our own lust. We, uh, we get led by our own flesh instead of the things of God. We can let other people pull us one way or the other. We allow a spirit of cynicism to settle in oftentimes. I think every pastor would probably be able to agree with that to a degree. We can get a spirit of cynicism even in the work of God. We start seeing that there's a, you know, a lack of a love or something, or at least our perception or something. And boy, uh, it's easy for that, that kind of thing to be able to settle into our life and make us, what does it do? It causes us to be cold and indifferent. It doesn't happen to be just pastors, amen. We all fall into that. We can all start to kind of micromanage other people's lives and, and figure out that we, we know more than they do. And, not, you know, and, and ultimately, does it matter? No. Uh, what is our business? Following the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Letting him lead. And, uh, but oftentimes these are things that just kind of distract us. We become uh, callous toward spiritual warfare and the things that's going on all around us. We think that it's not really that important, the things that we're in. And that's the illustration of our passage. The man of God, he, he started well. I mean, man, he goes to this place. Can you imagine the excitement level of that prophet right about there? He says, uh, God says, I got a message for you. This is where I want you to go. I want you to go to Bethel. I want you to go to that, that idolatry, uh, idolatrous place. I want you to go to the idol. I want you to prophesy against it. Go ahead, put your hand on that. Announce some judgment. And then you look over and you see Jeroboam there. Amen. <laughs> I would imagine this had to be the adrenaline dump. If you were, if you were in it, man, this was it. I mean, there, I guarantee you, he didn't say, oh, good. Guess everybody's here. You know, let me go pronounce some judgment real quick. No, I mean, I, I guarantee you, he was, wor his heart was pumping. Guarantee it. That's what's going on right there. But the thing is, he didn't consider all of his enemies. He understood that he had an enemy in Jeroboam. He knew that wasn't going to go well, but he didn't consider the other sides of the spectrum that were against him. By the time he actually leaves town, I look at it in verse number 24, it says, when he was gone, a lion met him by the way and slew him. His carcass was cast in the way and the ass stood by it, and the, the lion also stood by the carcass. In the remaining few verses, I just want us to see a few things that will cost you and prevent you from finishing your course with joy. I think as you look at this man, you see, man, he, he started very well. Man, he did the hard things by all accounts. You would say, this is the, I mean, this is climax area right here, mountaintop, and being able to pronounce that judgment. And then, and then all of a sudden, here's Jeroboam. He says, get him, and his hand dries up, and then he's able to speak, and that, that hand is restored. Man, you talk about king of the mountain experience right there. And now all of a sudden, Jeroboam, Jeroboam wants to be your buddy. Yeah. And he's like, no, nope, got to go. Uh, he's like, Even if you offered half, me your ha uh, half of your house to me, I, like, I got to go. God said, can't stay here. We'll, we'll be seeing you guys. Good to see you. Thanks for everybody stopping by. We got to go. Amen. And all of a sudden, he's out. But that wasn't the end of the matter. God wanted more for him. God wanted him to finish. There was more in store for, for that man. And yet he lost it all just want to ask you, what is it that will cost you? What will cost you? First of all, thinking any other word is as true as God's word will cost you. And notice what happens in verse number 15. It says, then he said unto him, this is talking about the old prophet. He goes and he finds this man of God. And he said unto him, come home with me and eat bread. And he said, I may not return with thee, nor go in with thee, neither will I eat bread, nor drink water with thee in this place. For it was said to me by the word of the Lord, thou shalt uh, eat no bread, nor drink water there, nor turn again to go by the way that thou camest. He said unto him, I am a prophet also as thou art. And an angel spake unto me by the word of the Lord, saying, bring him back with thee into thine house, that he may eat bread and drink water. But he lied unto him. Uh, don't believe doctrines that are not found in the Word of God. Amen. Don't believe doctrines not found in the Word of God. I can imagine uh, this man of God, he looks at that old prophet and he, and he says, you know, he probably knows. I mean, he's an old prophet. He's, he's probably done this kind of thing dozens of times. Man, there's probably plenty of times he's, he's pronounced these type of things. He probably uh, would have loved to have read what we just read there at the end of verse number 18 where he says, but he lied unto him. 
I bet he would have loved for somebody to have clued him in on that. Uh, lying is only effective whenever it's masquerading as truth. Amen? Uh, whenever there's that, that uh, if I stood up and said, hey, by the way, I'm the president of the United States. You didn't know that. Secret. Yeah, you'd say, this guy's an idiot. You know, uh, you know that, that, that's a lie that wouldn't, wouldn't fool anybody. But whenever it's something that's masquerading as truth, that's whenever it causes its damage. You know, I've known many men that were preachers for years, but it doesn't mean that they stayed true to the Word of God. Uh, it just means that there was somebody that would hire them. Amen. That happens. Compare everything to the Word of God. Compare it all to the Word of God. The Apostle Paul, he knew how quickly uh, those that would pervert Scripture would actually come into the church and start to infiltrate and, 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 and carry them about uh, contrary to what it is that the Lord uh, gave in His Word. Whenever he wrote that letter to the churches of Galatia, he said in Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 through 10, he says, I marvel that you're so soon removed from Him that, that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another. But there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. And then he says in verse 8, But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. He says, listen, don't let anybody tell you anything different. Let the Word of God be true and every man a liar. Amen. Man, stick to the Word of God. People will hear that today and they say, you know, uh, it doesn't sound like Paul was very inclusive. Uh, no. You know, he's, uh, he's, it might have hurt someone's feelings. It, that's true. That's true. But I can assure you, I can absolutely assure you in our text, whenever that man of God rounded the corner, he had already heard the profession of God that he was going down. Can you imagine whenever he saddles the ass and he, uh, he's, he's going on about his business and he says, oh boy, I did it. Rounds the corner and there's a line standing there. I guarantee you when faced with that lion or hurting the old prophet's feelings, he said, I wish I would have just hurt his feelings. I wish I would have just stuck to what, what God said and not let anybody turn me away from the Word of God. Can I tell you, don't let anybody turn you away from the Word of God. Amen. Everybody's got an idea. Everybody's got an opinion. Everybody loves their opinion. The reason they have their opinion is they believe that their opinion is truth. <laughs> there is one truth, and that truth is found in the Word of God. If your opinion is contrary to the Word of God, God is true, and you're a liar. Amen. Let the Word of God be the truth in your life. Listen, everybody's got an idea. Everybody's got a thought. It does not matter what you think. It doesn't matter what I think. All that matters is what does the Word of God have to say. <clears throat> There's always some kind of an alternative bread and water. Now God's going to take care of His man. Amen? He wasn't leading, leaving him out there and saying, all right, uh, don't take bread or water from anybody else. You just stay there until you starve to death. That's not what he was going to do. God was going to take care of his man. God's got that provided, but there's always some that alter or that offer an alternative bread and water. And this alternative bread and water that's alternative to what God was offering actually cost this man his life. Now, think about why was God so upset about that? You ever think about that? I mean, it's bread and water. It's not like he stayed there for a steak dinner and cake and all that and just made a pig out of him. It was bread and water. And yet, in reality, all through Scripture, God is laying out a picture for, for who? For His Son. Yeah. And that's exactly who Jesus came, uh, came to, to be. This is who it is He represents. Jesus said in John 6, 35, He says, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Can you imagine if God would not have judged that man? And we would sit here today and say, look at that. Uh, there's somebody else offering bread and water. That bread and water is just as good as God's. No. No, uh, no, there is no alternative to the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Listen, uh, He is sufficient for all. He is the one who meets your every need. Jesus said, and remember, He was talking to the Samaritan woman at the, at the well, and, and they had that great discussion, and He said, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. There is no alternative to the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 11, he said, uh, he says, don't, uh, don't be deceived. He said, there are a lot of deceivers. There's a lot of false apostles at work. And he goes down to the 14th verse, verse and he says, Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. You know, I, I wonder 
I've read over that passage many times, and I wonder how much that that old prophet, was he making that up? Or did he have an angel of light tell him, no, 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 no. God wants you to tell him. Didn't line it up with Scripture. By the way, uh, the people that may be talking to you and telling you some kind of false doctrine, God will take care of that. Your responsibility is not what every person believes. Your responsibility is staying true to the Word of God. What does the Bible say? Amen? It, It doesn't matter. Listen, you don't have to know the background of every cult that's here. You, you spend a lot of time studying cults, and there's no reason for that whatsoever. Amen? Uh, there's no need to be deceived by those things. Know the Word of God. Amen. And then whenever something is contrary to the Word of God, you know, that's not the Word of God. I'm going to keep moving. I'm going to keep faithful to the Word of God. The more that we start to see the warnings of God about receiving and continuing in His Word and all the things that He shares with us, the more that we start to understand that His Word, it's not just about attaining information. One of the greatest uh, problems that, that, that are often faced by Christians is looking at the Bible and saying, well, you know, this is just some information that I need to get. I need some more answers about this, that, and the other. And rather than saying that it is instrumental in your salvation, it's instrumental in your sanctification, it's instrumental in your walk with God, uh, it's instrumental to be able to know exactly what the plan of God is, the will of God is, uh, your fruitfulness for the cause of Christ, it's all found in the Word of God. God shows us what we need. He shows us how to walk. Then we As we start seeing things that are out of whack with God, we align ourselves to be able to be in line with Him. Amen? We put ourselves in line with the Bible. We don't look and say, well, you know, I just don't don't like to see it that way. There has to be that spirit of humility to be able to say, God is the one who knows. If it's God's plan, I want to align my life with God's plan. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14 and 15, he says, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men, and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things which is the head, even Christ. We have to align ourselves with Christ. A life conformed to the Word of God is always going to resemble the author. Amen? You're going to start looking more like Christ and less like this world. It'll cost you, secondly, by not finishing what was started. By not finishing what was started. There's a lot of things we can get started in, but God calls for us to finish. Verse number 14, if you look in our text, he says, he says, he went after the man of God and he found him sitting under an oak. And he said unto him, art thou the man of God that camest from Judah? And he said, I am. Then he said unto him, come home with me and eat bread. God didn't send this man to tell who the next king would be. And then that was the end of the matter. Whenever he's sending the the man of God, he had a distinct purpose. Amen. He says, now I I want you to go. I want you to cry it against that altar. I want you to tell him about the king that's coming. But then he also said, here's your follow-up. See, God uh, God has an exit plan as well. Amen. Uh, uh, As people today, God does not call you to just be saved and then, you know, meander around until he comes back. God has an exit plan. Amen. God's got a purpose that he wants each one of us to be involved in for the cause of Christ. He wants us to be able to, 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 to walk in accordance with His Word. He wants us to be able to reach people that are lost and in their sins and dying on their way to a devil's hell. Listen, uh, have you looked at the news? Have you seen Israel? Have you seen the things that are shaping up around you? Don't let anybody look at you and say, you know, it's probably all just a bunch of fluff. I doubt the Lord's coming. Well, I, I gather to say He is. Amen. Man, uh, the more that we start lining up the, w- what we see right now all around us, and you say, you know, amazingly enough, it looks just like what the Bible says. Amen. What does it mean? The Lord's coming. You ready to meet Him? See, uh, whenever that time comes, uh, God's not asking for us, well, let's just wander around aimlessly and consumed by our own thoughts and our own ideology. He says, I want you to get lined up with the Word of God because, listen, man, we are, we are part of the army of God. Amen. We're supposed to be about His business. Finish what has started. God wants us to be faithful to the end. He wants us to finish. You know, Jesus spoke a lot about finishing. Amen? A lot of things he said about finishing what will start. In Luke chapter 14, verse 28 to 30, he says, He says, For which of you, in intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first and counteth the cost, whether he hath sufficient to finish it? Amen. I'm always amazed whenever I say a house that was just left in. Uh, uh, not complete, incomplete, incomplete, whatever it is. Uh, but, but 
incomplete. I, whenever you, you know, I, I look, I'll see this massive house, beautiful house. I can think of two right now. I watched forever. I was like, when are they going to put windows in that thing? You know, don't they know it's raining inside? You know, and, and you're looking, and you're like, surely. I, I mean, this thing, it, it, it had to cost them a half million dollars just to build the shell. Why can they not afford windows? I mean, it just bothered me. I don't know what the story is. I don't have any clue whatsoever. Maybe they died, you know, half of the, I don't know. Y'all tell me later. You'll, you'll probably be able to pick my houses, I'm thinking. But there's something about it. It's a, you know, did they not plan on windows? Did that get left out? You know, and, and, and that's what Jesus is saying. He says, uh, he says, less happily after he hath laid the foundation, he's not able to finish it. All that behold it began to mock him saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Now I look at that as a house, but, but think about that. Uh, as the, temple of, uh, as the uh, uh, people of the temple of God, where the Holy Spirit lives within you, God started a work in you at salvation. Nobody should be able to look at your life and say, was God not able to finish it? Were they not going to be faithful to see that life all the way through to the end? Was God not, not so good that, that He give them salvation, but then continue to meet the needs day in and day out, and then instruct them to be able to walk in accordance with His will? We have a testimony. Finishing what is started, it's a matter of Christ's likeness. There's Christ's likeness. Jesus was on the cross. He made that great statement. He said, it is finished. The work of redemption, it was completed by God. Aren't you glad that Jesus was able to complete the work of redemption? What did he do? Jesus, the very Son of God, left heaven. He humbled himself to be born of a virgin, lived on this sin-cursed earth, lived a perfect sinless life, so that whenever he went to the cross at Calvary, he did not die for his own sin. Every sin that you have committed, every sin that I have committed was laid upon the Lord Jesus Christ and he died in our place. He suffered the wrath of God. It was poured out upon him because we couldn't pay for our own sin. He took it. He says, I'll give you the, hey, listen, you're not going to heaven by goodness, amen. You have to, it's righteousness that God is looking for. That, what does that mean? Sinless perfection. Yeah, well, we've all broken that one. All of sin to come short of the glory of God. So whenever Jesus died, he took all of that sin upon himself. He died in our place. And then what does he do? He gives salvation as a gift. He finished it. See, if Jesus would have stayed in the grave, then our redemption would be incomplete. It wouldn't be paid. There would have been something incomplete because if, if the only way Jesus was able to raise from the grave is that he remained sinless, that he remained God in the flesh. If he would have ever sinned any point in his life, we wouldn't have a Savior. He followed everything through to completion. He's seated at the right hand of God the Father, making intercession for us. The Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You're not saved by keeping the law. You're not saved by being a good person. You're not saved by being on the pew this morning. You're not saved on how much money that you gave uh, to church. It's not about, not about those things. It's not saved by, by being baptized. Your salvation is by receiving Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. And His righteousness is added to your account so that whenever you go to heaven, you're not going on your name. You're going on the name of the sinless Son of God. He finished the work. Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 4, verse 7 and 8, he says, I fought a good fight. I've finished my course. I've kept the faith. I, I bet if the man of God in our text, I bet if that man of God would have been able to, to look back on the matter, he would have seen how little it took for him to get off track. I bet he was, I bet whenever he saw the line, he's like, oh, brother, I can't believe I did that. So easy. How do we get off track? It's just as easy. Amen? How do we get off track? I'll give you just a couple. Idleness. Idleness. So very easy. Verse number 14 says, He went after the man of God. He found him sitting under an oak. Sitting under an oak tree. I bet, I started thinking, I wonder what he was thinking about. Here's the man of God. I, I mean, you would think he would be saying, Man, <laughs> the altar split, ashes fell out, Jeroboam, you know. I, in reality, I started thinking about it. I was like, you know what I bet he was thinking about? I bet he was sitting under that tree and he was saying, man, he was offering bread and water. Kind of hungry. Kind of thirsty. The more that you're idle, the more you start thinking on things that you really shouldn't be thinking of. Uh, if I'm working, the last thing I want to do is stop and eat. Really is. If I'm working on something, especially something outdoors, you're hot, sweat, 
man, Kim already knows. Just don't even, don't even call me. I'm not coming in. Yeah, I, I don't want to stop. It's terrible. I mean, there are times where I'm just like, I have to stop, you know, but, but I just, I, I don't like that at all. There's something about when you're working, when you're busy, you just want to kind of keep it what you're, what you're doing. But if I'm idle, I don't require hunger to eat. Amen. 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 It's just something about that, isn't it? You sit on the couch and you're just like, I could eat something. Yeah. You just ate. Yeah, I could probably eat something else. I just, you ever have this conversation? I just kind of want something a little sweet. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> and before long, we're making a tub of homemade ice cream and yeah. asking for the big ladle. Amen. What is it? Idleness. Idleness. Sometimes it, it happens by not reconciling ourselves to the Word of God. Isn't it odd that that old prophet had to ask if he was the man of God? Yeah, come on. That's a, that's a, I mean, that should have been bells and whistles going off right there for that man of God. As he was sitting there underneath the oak tree thinking about his bread and water, and this guy comes up and he says, I'm a prophet too. Are, are you that guy that was in town? If you're a prophet, you should know that. Yeah. Hey Amen. It wasn't like he was in the marketplace and there was a thousand people all rummaging around. That's, that's not right. He's the only guy out there. You the, you that man of God? Of course he is. Of course he is. No brainer. Remember whenever Saul was saved, Saul of Tarsus, he was saved and, and, uh, and he was carrying on into, he went on into uh, Damascus. He was blind. He was having to be led by his hand there and Ananias walked in. Remember, uh, Ananias didn't look over there at Saul of Tarsus and say, hey, you Saul? Uh, it's supposed to be some blind guy around here. I'm supposed to, you know, welcome. He knew who it was. Acts 9 verse 17 says, Ananias went his way and he entered into the house and putting his hands on him said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest to sent me, that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. Remember Peter, uh, Peter was at the, uh, at the house of one Simon a Tanner. And, uh, yeah, uh, Simon a Tanner. And, and, uh, and you remember uh, the, the centurion Cornelius was, was inquiring about the Lord and, they, and, uh, and, and he sent some messengers to go get Peter. And Acts chapter 10 verse number 21 says that uh, Peter went down to the men which were sent unto him from Cornelius and said, Behold, I am he whom you seek. Man, they just showed up. Uh, you know, how did he know? How did they know one another? He didn't walk down and say, All right, who are you guys? Who, who is this? Who sent you? Are you? There was none of that. How did he know? Because just a couple of verses sooner, the Holy Spirit said, the men which seek thee downstairs. He already knew. Whenever it's God's word, it's truth. You know it to be true. It's amazing whenever we want truth, but we look in every place except the source of truth. During idle times, easy to fall into deception. So I want to avoid that deception. Be busy about the cause of Christ. God's already addressed how this man should, should walk through the land. He instructs us how it is that we're to walk after we are saved as well. He wants us to be able to see our journey. He wants us to go all the way to completion. Amen. He doesn't want us to get sidetracked. He wants us to, to know his, his good and acceptable and perfect will of God. We need to be faithful about the things of God. God addresses our salvation, our service, our witness for Christ. What does he tell us? Finish what was started in you finish. Lastly, it'll cost you when thinking that judgment is going to be put away. Thinking that judgment is going to be put away. Now look down at our text to verse number 20. We're almost done, I promise. Verse 20, it says, and it came to pass as they sat at the table that the word of the Lord came unto the prophet that brought him back. And he cried unto the man of God that came from Judah saying, thus saith the Lord, for as much as thou hast disobeyed the mouth of the Lord and hast not kept the commandment which the Lord thy God commandeth thee, but camest back and hast eaten bread and drunk water in the place of the which the Lord did say to thee, eat no bread or drink no water. Thy carcass shall not come unto the sepulcher of thy fathers. Can you imagine the man of God as he was sitting there? He's like, you're the one that invited me. Are you kidding me? And he's like, by the way, you're not making it home, buddy. He's like, come on. It's interesting. The man of God, he was, he was able to faithfully proclaim that there was judgment on the king for his idolatry, but he didn't consider that God would equally judge his own derelict of duty. Right. He knew the word of God, but it was easy to put it aside. As a child of God, our sins, uh, they've already been judged in the body of the Lord Jesus Christ at Calvary. Amen?
But if, if you have received Christ as Savior, you, you don't have to fear hell. That's a blessing, amen? But there are rewards to be gained or lost as a child of God. In 2 Corinthians 5, verse number 10, it says, We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. I want you to turn real quick with me over to 1 Corinthians chapter number 3. 1 Corinthians chapter number 3, I just want you to see this. Now remember, there's two different uh, seats of judgment. There's that great white throne of judgment that is for unbelievers, where those that uh, those are cast into the, uh, uh, the lake of fire there at the end. But but there's also the judgment seat of Christ, and that is for believers. And that's what you see in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse number 13. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians 3, verse 13 said, Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and that fire shall try every man's work what sort it is. Uh, fire in Scripture is always referring to judgment. It's God's judgment that's there. If any man's work abide, in verse number 14, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so is by fire. What's God doing? God is looking upon the hearts of those and the, the deeds that are done. You're not saved by your works, amen, uh, but there are rewards associated with your works, but it's those that are done out of that pure heart for God. Uh, things that are done for your own name, for your own honor, your own glory at that day of judgment is going to be just burnt right off, and it's not going to count for the first thing. Verse 16, it says, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God uh, destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. God takes this matter of faithfulness very seriously in his children. And so should we. Why is that? It's because it's very costly for us to put aside what we know of the Word of God. You see, all through this passage, God has just given us a little synopsis of the life of a believer. How we get started. How do you get started in this life today to receive Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? But that's not the end. That's the beginning of your life. And as you go through it, and God has a purpose, God has a plan for your life, uh, man, there's going to be some of the greatest blessings that you'll ever know in your life as, you're, as you just humble yourself and you follow Him. I'm so thankful that the Lord called me to preach. I, I look back on it, and man, it's just been the greatest time of my entire life. You couldn't have convinced me of that all those years ago. I thought, this is horrible. Uh, it's not. Challenges? Yep. You bet. Still challenges to come? Sure. I wouldn't trade it for anything. Amen. The same thing is true about salvation. Oh, I wouldn't trade it for anything. Does it mean that whenever you're saved, you, you don't have any more problems? Not at all. Not at all. You're still going to have health issues, still going to have financial issues. Uh, you're still going to have problems in life. There's still going to be things that come against you. But guess who you have? You've got God on your side. Amen. Amen. Listen, you've got a heavenly Father to meet the needs. Let me ask you, if you died today, would you go to heaven? Are you sure if, if, if today was the day, man, we, we see the things shaping up all around us. If today was the day where the Lord says, time to go, dun, dun, boom, out of here. Would you still be here? Would you go with God? How do I know? Whenever I was 15 years old in a gray and white frame house in the middle bedroom, I knelt down beside my bed. And I didn't know everything, certainly not, still don't. But I knew that I was a sinner. And I knew that if I died right then, I'd go to hell. But I also understood that Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins. And I knew that he gave salvation as a gift. And I confessed that I was a sinner, that Jesus was the Savior. And I asked him to forgive me of my sin and to be my personal Savior. The Bible says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. You can know about your salvation today. This could be your day. You say, man, I'm just not sure. I, you know, I try to do enough good things. You can't do enough good things. God's not looking for you to do enough good things. God is looking for you to come to the end of yourself. Put all of your trust and hope in Jesus and Him alone. Let's all stand together. We'll have a hymn of invitation. If you're saved, I wonder, are you devoted to the cause of Christ? Is He still guiding your life? Is He directing your steps? You may need to be settled today. You may need to be, may need to be serving today. Don't find yourself out of touch with God. Be tender toward the moving of the Spirit of God. Amen?
Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you for allowing us the privilege of being here. We thank you, Lord, for this passage that's recorded for us so long ago and how much that it still meets the needs today and how much that you, you speak to it or to us through that passage, Lord, and shows us our need of being devoted to you. Lord, if there's one here that doesn't know Christ as Savior, I do pray that today would be the day of salvation. Lord, I pray, Father, for each of us that we'd be settled into serving you. Lord, as we look around, we understand that our time here is very close. It's close to your coming. God, I pray, Father, that you would find us ready to receive you. Lord, that we're looking forward to your coming, looking forward to that day. God, I pray, Father, that you would help us to always honor you. Lord, it may be that the people that are here are saved, but oh, we need to be settled in serving. Lord, would you give us a heart for Christ, Lord, that we would be yielded to you in all things. We just thank you for a time of invitation. We ask, Lord, that you would use it. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Amen. Number 296. 296. You need to come pray. Why don't you come pray? Not sure if you die today, if you go to heaven, why don't you come? We'd be glad to show you the Word of God, how you can be sure. You may need to pray. Look ahead. You see God is coming at any time. We want to be ready.